Hi and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing, I'm Nick Thomas. So on this channel we frequently show a whole range of antique swords, a great number of them in fact, and so often when we do show them, uh, I like to give as much information as possible, but so often people want to know more, and specifically they want to see them closer up, and they want um, specifications on them, and I fully understand that because I love getting the, the specs on uh, antique swords as well because it's hugely interesting to those of us that um, especially want to understand the swords in terms of how they handle and, and how you want them to be reproduced and how you want to produce training swords and uh, cutting swords and all these kinds of things. So I'm going to do this new series where I'm going to take one sword per video. Now, I appreciate there are two swords on this table. But the other one is there for context when I start explaining it to you. But I'm going to take one sword per video, and I'm going to give you a really thorough look at it that's going to cover a range of topics that I know people want to hear about with these swords. So it's going to show you close up all the parts of the sword. I'm going to go through with weighing scale, tape measure, and calipers to go through various measurements of this sword so you can understand more about um, its, its build characteristics uh, and also of how you might want to reproduce it if that's your kind of thing. Um, and at the same time, I'm also going to cover a little bit of the history of the particular pattern or regulation of that particular sword. Now, not all of the swords that I cover on this series are going to be pattern or regulation swords, but a lot will be. And so I will talk a little bit about that as well so that you understand um, quite how the sword came about and maybe how it was judged and that kind of thing and who used it because these are all really important things. So my main interest in terms of collecting swords is British Napoleonic and, and heavily infantry although I have a lot of cavalry swords as well but my collection does expand earlier and later and a few other non-British swords as well so I'm going to cover a variety and because friends often send me stuff to, you know, to get collected or send on, I get other swords in that I can show you as well beyond just my personal collection. But I thought we'd start with this 1803, very, very beautiful, ivory hilted with all the blue and gilt. I've shown this a fair bit on the channel in the last couple of months and people are pretty excited by it. So I thought we'd start this series on this particular sword because I love it and, and, and pretty much everybody that sees it loves it. And that's understandable because it is... It's beautiful and savage all at the same time, and to be honest, that's that's my, my preferred kind of sword. So, let's get started. To give an overview of um, how this sword came about and when it's from, uh, the reason that it is so important and so significant to the story of British swordsmanship is that it's the first regulation or pattern of sword that was uh, used for the infantry as a sabre because before this the the first regulation swords were spadroons so they did there were some curved blades used by um, by officers and things like that but as far as regulation swords go the first ever regulations were spadroons this is the second um, regulation that came in but the blades are the same and you can see it's a straight light cut and thrust sword um, and in the late 1700s some officers started carrying sabres completely against regulation and it was kind of accepted for certain officers, specifically the flank officers, and your flank officers therefore are your grenadiers and your light infantry officers. They are called the flanks because they form up as the flank companies um, in battle and then the, the companies in between are your line. So your line are your bog standard infantry, your grenadiers are kind of your heavy infantry, they're usually the tallest and the best equipped and you could say the bravest and strongest. Um, people would argue that, but that's the idea. The grenadiers um, are, are the kind of blunt instrument, and the light infantry, therefore, um, are the, the skirmishers. They can act as, light, as line infantry if need be, but they are better trained and designed to be able to skirmish as well. So basically what you're talking about is the two elites of, of the unit. And their officers started carrying sabres, and it did get accepted, and there is a sword that or a range of swords that kind of fit within that because they're not a reg regulation or pattern sword but they started carrying these swords and they were a downsized version of the 1796 light cavalry sabre and I've got a number of those examples and I will be showing them in future videos but this video is about the 1803 I just had to get that a bit of history over with to begin with because the 1803 was the first regulation acceptance of a, of a sabre for infantry officers and they've, therefore what we have is this slot hilt sabre so it is called a slot hilt sabre because of these slots here that are in the guard. Now this type of guard, the kind of slot hilt, not the specific 
fashion of this one, but the slot tilt styles, they came into use around about the 1760s. And they weren't just popular with the British, the French also used them, the Americans started using them and, and, and beyond. Um, but this particular example, is we call the 1803 was actually already in use in the 1790s so the the foot guards were using this exact type of hilt uh, in this illustration in 1793 so this hilt does go back a bit further than people would necessarily assume and it's often called the gr uh, hilt or the guards hilt and um, that could be because well it came from the guards first it could also be um, from the, the GR section here, which is the GR cipher, which is on all of the 1803s. Uh, you'll also see that that GR cipher is also on the blade there. So this GR, the two GR letters, um, that is G for George, that is King George, the current monarch at the time, and R for Rex, which in Latin means King. So GR literally means King George. So you will find that on every single one of these 1803 infantry officers' sabers. Um, but yes, so the hilt is sometimes called the guard's hilt or the GR hilt, and it does have this big GR on it. So this is completely standardized for the 1803 types of saber. The only really thing that tends to deviate is this, this pommel or backstrap section, which as you can see is a um, lion head. So sometimes it is a full lion's head as this version is, and sometimes it's a half where it cuts off uh, the knuckle bow here and that's actually in many ways a slightly more comfortable version to fight with whereas this full lion's head is just fancier and you know it, it's still pretty effective it's still pretty comfortable um, now the grip ivory which is what this is you can find ivory grips and bone grips but actually what is most common on these is um, is shagreen um, which is a form of uh, you know shark skin or ray skin things like that and they use other fish as well um, and you will occasionally find leather, although leather is quite unusual. Um, but this one is ivory, which is, is quite unusual. Now, ivory at the time was generally considered to be for senior officers. And uh, in the Navy, for example, a senior officer would be considered a captain upwards. So a captain would be allowed to have ivory on their grips. An equivalent um, rank of, of the captain in the Navy in the Army is colonel. So uh, you think a captain is in command of a ship and a colonel is usually in command of a regiment. So as a rule, you'd think this ivory grip is very much a high ranking um, uh, feature, which is generally true. Although um, some officers who had the money um, and their commanding officers allowed it did get ivory. And within say uh, militia and volunteer units, ivory became popular as well. So it was used more than just high ranking officers. Uh, some general staff, things like that, wore them as well. So ivory was a bit more common than just the very, very high ranking officers. And that is where the regulation stops. So the regulation is this GR slot hilt guard with the lion's um, backstrap. And I will m mention at this point, there are some swords around that have this guard's hilt, but with a plain backstrap as you'd find on a 1796. Um, like cavalry saber, uh, there's some speculation that those might be sergeant swords or maybe just early swords. It's not exactly clear, but anyway, they, they are around and they are quite interesting. Now, talking about regulations, what is not really at all forming as a regulation or pattern on this sword is the blade. So there was no regulation blade type for this sword other than it was a sable which means in english at the time it means it was curved so with the um, infantry officers spadroon the regulation stated that the blade had to be 32 inches long by one inch minimum at the shoulder which is here so this has to be one inch minimum width and the blade has to be 32 inch long and straight so i mean you can still make a fair diff basically a fair variety of blades within those restrictions but when it comes to the saber, there were none of those whatsoever. It just had to be curved and that was it. And as a result, you will find a massive, massive variety in blade lengths and curvatures, as well as blade widths and blade weights, and even to some degree blade styles, because this has the more typical wide fullered blade. So most of these 1803s have a blade that looks like a light cavalry saber, but is usually just a little bit smaller. Um, and in, in most cases lighter, although not always. This one is an especially beefy and substantial example. So it has the wide fuller, which is very characteristic of the light cavalry sabers of the time. You can also find them completely unfullered, so flat blades, and that's usually from the influence of the 
Mamluk Shamshir uh, swords from the British experience in Egypt and I will be showing some swords that are very directly of that influence in the future. So what else can we say about this sword? Well, I think at this stage we should probably get into some specification before I go on any more. So we've got various tools here to look at the specification of this sword. So first of all the weight. So this sword comes in at 1015 grams so just over one kilo which is 2.2 pounds. That is very heavy for this type of saber or sword. So most 1803s are actually in the ca in the range of about seven to eight hundred grams. It's unusual they break over nine hundred, and super unusual to break over a, a kilo. So what you have here is a completely normal sized 1803 because the blade length, and we'll talk about that in a minute. This is a typical blade length for an 1803, and yet it is monstrous on its weight. Now you might think that with that kind of weight, you might think it's a very heavy sword in the hand and an unwieldy sword in the hand, and it absolutely is not. And the reason for that is the mass distribution and balance um, and the way it's been constructed. So I'm gonna talk about that more as we go on. But if I just get the scale out of the way, clear some space. So the blade length. Remember I said the regulation infantry spadrone length at the time is um, 32 inch, which is about 82 centimeters. Whereas this 1803 Sabre has a 75 centimeter or 29 and a half inch blade. So that is actually very short. Uh, the British Navy cutlass of this period had a 28 to 29 inch blade. So this is almost as short. It's a whisker longer than the the navy cutlass of the era so it is very short the regulation cavalry sabers of this time were 32 to 33 inch blades so it is quite short and actually most of these 1803s are they range in blade lengths from as low as about 63 64 centimeters up to about 84 to 85 which is slightly longer than the regulation light cavalry sabers so yes they can be shorter than a cutlass and longer than a light cavalry saber, which is a little bit confusing. And the reason for that is, is that at this time, officers had to purchase their own swords. They were not supplied to them and they were not made for the government or for the military. So we typically think of soldiers equipment being supplied to them by, by the army through military contractors. But with officers, they had to purchase their own equipment and source their own equipment. So they didn't buy it from the army, they bought it from wherever they fancied, in fact. And this was the case all the way up until World War I. And, and therefore, if an officer had to buy his equipment, and that would be everything from, from his camp equipment to his uniform, his hat, his sword, everything, he could go wherever he wanted to buy it. And that means he could go to a high quality smith of the era, um, a sword manufacturer of the era, like um, Osborne or Gill, or he could just go to an outfitter or a uniform maker and just buy everything all at once. And that would be a roll of the dice as to what kind of quality he got. It also means that an officer can stipulate what specification of sword they want, or they can buy off the shelf. So <clears throat> they might specifically go to a sword maker and ask for specific features, lengths, curvatures, weights, all kinds of things, and sometimes even more custom features, like you will find 1803 sabers with outer branches on the guard here that start to resemble a later three bar saber. So they could specify a variety of different specifications or they could buy off the shelf, which means there's a whole spectrum of what they could end up with. And as I said, because this particular sword has no regulation for its blade, they could end up with wildly different um, blade lengths, blade weights and blade, blade curvatures. So this isn't a particularly curved example. It, it is a very well curved saber, but the 1803 is famous for being very, very curved. So this one is not particularly um, curved at all. So the way that we measure curvature is we get the, the tip and the blade shoulder in, in line on a straight line like this. And then we measure the, the width at the widest point. So oh, I'll just shift it there. So this blade has a a curve of just over five centimeters, just over two inches. 
So that is actually quite a lot for a sabre. You know, most sabres, particularly into the 19th century, have far less. Um, that's quite a lot of curve, especially for a short blade. And yes, as I said, this is actually one of the lesser curved examples that I've ever seen because they are famously curvy, these swords. Now, so you now understand that the blade lengths could be hugely varied. The curvatures can be hugely varied. Let's now talk about the width and the depth because that is actually quite unusual on this example. So these 1803 flank officer sabres, I said with the length they can be hugely varied. And now in terms of the width and therefore the weight, because the wider you go on the blade and the, and the, and the more depth you have, inevitably there's going to be more steel. So they can vary from being a tiny little nimble thing to being absolutely beastly. Now this one is absolutely beastly. At over a kilo for a blade that's only 75 centimeters, that is a heavy sword. And remember when we talk about heavy swords, people that you know, are more familiar with earlier swords that have big pommels on them will not think of a one kilo sword as being particularly heavy. But when you get to these swords that have back straps and sabers and things like that, one kilo is a lot because they don't have a huge amount of counterbalance. So <clears throat> total weights tell us a good amount about a sword, but the mass distribution is more important. So for example, in our HEMA training, a one kilo, let's say side sword, is a very, very fast and nimble sword, whereas a British heavy cavalry saber of the Napoleonic period is also around about one kilo and is known to be cumbersome and a bit, and a bit heavy. So weight tells us a reasonable amount, but mass distribution is more important. Basically, weight will tell you a fair bit if you've got photos to see what you're looking at. Like if you see this sword and you know it's a kilo, you know it's beastly. So let's talk about this width. The, the blade is a absolute, sorry, I haven't zeroed it, because that's not right. There we go, zero it up. And the blade is an absolutely whopping almost 4.5 centimeters. In fact, if I go all the way to here, yeah, it's, it's almost 4.5 centimeters wide. That is incredibly wide. It's a very, very wide blade. But also, if you then look at the shoulder, so the shoulder is where the blade meets the guard. And we usually talk about the shoulder as being the widest point, although it can, the shoulder can be the other side as well, but we normally talk about the shoulder on the back because that's the widest point. And if we measure that, we are pushing close to 10 millimeters depth. Now, most swords of this era are around about eight to nine millimeters here, and then they have complex distal taper. So distal taper is the, the width here, and then how much it reduces the width down to the tip, whereas profile taper is the width of the blade down to here. So profile is, is this width and distal taper is the depth. So most swords of this era have a, um, a depth on the shoulder of around about eight to nine millimeters, um, but they can go down to as much as six. In my experience, most of the ones that are around about six are not very good swords. They tend to be a bit overly flexible and they just don't handle particularly well. In my experience, the ones that handle the best are the ones that have the broadest shoulders, uh, as well as the rigidity that it affects. Um, so Spadrons, for example, um, this is a good solid example that is, is fairly robust. So this one is actually 8.5 millimeters at the shoulder. So this is an example of a really nice robust Spadrone, but they can drop down to six. And a, a Spadrone with a six mil blade is from all the ones I've seen, absolutely horrible because they obviously don't have much profile um, width. So there's not a lot of mass unless you put it in the depth, which is what they've done with this spadroon. I'll talk about that in another video. So a blade here that is 4.5 centimeters wide by 10 millimeters depth inevitably has a lot of metal down here. Now, in terms of its distal taper, it, it actually has complex distal taper, which means it doesn't just evenly taper from here to, to, the, to the tip. It actually reduces reasonably quickly. And what that means is, is there's a massive amount of metal down here. And so despite the fact that this sword has a large total weight, it doesn't feel anything like as heavy as you might expect. And that is also affected by what's going on down here at the tip. So most 1803 sabers that have a fullered blade based on the light cavalry saber, their fullering stops about there approximately, and then the blade goes completely flat 
towards the tip, um, like a machete. And they are usually very, very narrow. They can be one millimeters and sometimes down to 0.8 millimeters in depth uh, at the actual point here, which is often where you're going to be delivering your cuts and thrusts. But this is different. This blade follows all the way to the tip and then has this reinforced tip on it as well. So what they've done here is they've given it a lot of depth to make a very strong and very stiff blade, but then they followed it all the way to the tip to make sure that it wasn't too heavy. So I suspect this was deliberate. This, they wanted a very stiff, very robust blade um, that also still wasn't cumbersome. So personally, I think with this sword, I think the officers specified a sword that looked fantastic but also was an incredible fighting weapon for up close fighting because it doesn't have a lot of reach but that's what it's designed for it's it's almost in the hanger and cutlass range it's, it's a close-up brawling weapon and i think that's very much what was specified here is that it's easy to look at this sword and think it just looks beautiful and magnificent and it absolutely does but underneath that ivory and gilt and and, and all the fanciness is actually just a really robust sword that is going to deliver powerful cuts, strong thrusts, is going to be reliable and, 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 and stay in one piece throughout a sustained fighting. Uh, and that goes for the, the guard as well, is that although it's a regulation guard, these can vary in, in, in size in terms of the grip length, the, the guard size, the width and the depth of the metalwork. They can vary a lot and this one is built big and robust. So I think this is a sword that 100% is a really strong fighting weapon, but then had fanciness added it on top. Now going back to the guard, so these um, these guards hilts, these GR hilts, they are brass or, or copper, and they then have gilt put on top, which is which is you know a, a gold to make them uh, shinier. But also, of course. Um, it's going to stay shiny for longer, whereas brass tends to tarnish really, really quickly. And you can see on the, on the back strap here where the gilt is worn off, so you're, you're more looking at um, copper now or brass, whereas on most of the guard here, it's still the original gilt. So there is some evidence that sergeants had these swords as well, but their swords would not have had any gilt work whatsoever. Now, I said that it's a big, brutish sword, but it does not handle like a slow sword. And I've explained a little bit about why, because there's a lot of metal down here. It's followed all the way to the tip. That all helps. But what does that actually mean in reality? Well, we can measure that by point of balance. So point of balance is where we balance the blade on one finger until it balances perfectly. And then we take a tape measure and measure the distance from the middle of the finger to the shoulder of the blade. So this is 11 centimeters just under, whisker under 11 centimeters. Now that is actually very close to the hand for this kind of sword. So most of the 1803s I've ever handled are actually more in the 13 to 15 centimeter balance range. Uh, they can vary a bit, but to give you an idea, um, spadroons, most of these balance around about 10 to 11 centimeters. So what you're saying is this savage, big, brutish 1803 saber balances exactly as a spadroon would, despite the fact that it is big and heavy. It's, it's not big in, in length, but it's, it's, it's a brutish blade that is over a kilo in total weight, but it balances as a spadroon would. And yet again, I think that's a specification that the officer has intentionally gone for, is that this hits hard, but it moves well, is reliable, and is going to thrust strongly. Um, because ultimately swords did break all the time so robustness was a major concern and when I said about the the tip I didn't actually measure it so I said a lot of sabers of this time have a depth of um, about one millimeter but this particular one if I measure it even down here it is two millimeters or more even at the tip so it is twice the thickness or more than most equivalent 1803s despite the fact that it isn't cumbersome, it hasn't added a ton of mass. So it's, it's strong here without compromising its handling characteristics. So there we go. This saber is 75 centimeter blade length with an 11 centimeter balance. 
It weighs a whisker over one kilo, that's 1,015 grams. It is brutish and yet nimble in the hand, which is quite impressive for a small sword that weighs over a kilo. Um, and is and is therefore quite a fascinating piece. And I'm going to show multiples of these 1803 type sabers because I do have a variety of them myself, and others come through me through friends. So I, I will show. I've got three more myself. I will show more, and uh, others along the way. If you've got any comments, do post them in the comments section. Um, one last thing to mention: this ring here. You might be wondering about this 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 ring that hangs loose. This is for a sword knot, so it's completely standard um, at this time period, uh, and in fact through most where the sabers were used, to have a sword knot, which would usually be, um, well, it was, ideally it's buff leather, but a lot of them were fancier and they went with, with, with basically gold and, uh, and red, crimson red, uh, crimson and gold um, uh, sword knots, and they dangle from the sword so that you can put your hand through, loop it up a few times and then grab the sword and it, it saves you from losing your sword. So if you lose your grip, the sword will just dangle loose. Also means you can dangle the sword from your wrist and fire a pistol, which is something that was noted to have been done at the time. Um, anything else that I could say about this saber? Well, I, I just will mention in terms of the history of them that the, um, the Spadroon 1796 pattern and the 1803, they survived together um, throughout their whole service life. So introduced in 1796, and introduced in 1803, although already in use for some units beforehand. They both uh, were phased out in 1822 in favour of a pipe back um, sabre, which is often called the Gothic hilt. And we'll talk about that in future videos as well. And the interesting thing about the Gothic hilt um, pipe back sabres is they kind of combine the ideas of these two swords, is they have the reach and agility of the spadroon but they have the curvature and a little bit more cutting power, ideally, of the sabre. Although it didn't always work out because some of those pipe backs were <laughs> as light as the spadroons, but it varied from one to another. So um, that's what happened, is that basically these two ideas got merged in 1822. Um, it's also worth saying that whilst this sword was intended as basically the elites for the flank um, officers, so the light infantry and the grenadiers, Ultimately, it is documented within regimental histories that some infantry officers, when they went on service, so they went to war or, or any, any hostile zones, did carry the 1803s as well against regulation, because ultimately an officer can get away with a fair bit, depending on how much leeway they're given by their commanding officer. So we know that some uh, of these 1803s were used by uh, line infantry officers. We also know they were favoured by some naval officers, um, so the Navy did have a regulation spadroon of their own from 1805, but we know that some of them did commonly often use a form of sabre as, um, as, as a close-in fighting weapon as well. And the, there are examples of this in 1803 that have, instead of the GR, they have the fouled anchor of the Navy on them. And so we know for definite they were for naval service. So, um, yeah, they weren't just for flank officers. They were also used by line infantry officers. They were also used by the Navy. And there was some usage of them also by units at home. So because of the risk of invasion from, from Napoleon in this period, there were massive forces raised um, at home that were intended only for home service, a bit like the Home Guard in World War II. And they, were, they varied a lot in quality, as you might expect. So there's the militias, the volunteers, um, and the yeomanry. And so there are various forces at home and, and a variety of those did use sabres of this kind as well. So the decoration that you see here on the blade is very, very typical of British swords of the Napoleonic period, although you'll see this kind of blue and gilt decoration on a range of different swords from different countries in this particular period. Um, so that's engraved on the blade and then the, um, the blue in and the gold is, is added afterwards. So that's very, very typical. Now, what you're seeing here in terms of these motifs on the blade, sometimes they can tell you something about the sword itself, the regiment, or perhaps the user, and sometimes the manufacturer, although more often than not, they actually don't tell you anything at all and they purely are decorative. So here we simply just have, you know, the, the George Crown, the GR Cipher, um, standard military motifs uh, you see with the um, there's, there's the uh, Union flag there, um, and we have um, uh, uh, basically a, a soldier in a Talisman style helmet, which was uh, a standard cavalry helmet of the time and also got adopted for certain infantry usages. Um, and then if we move on to the other side, uh, 
Well, we've got um, Britannia there, which is of course a very iconic um, symbol of, of Britain and, and Britain's military. And that's actually all there is to say about it. So sometimes in, in this detailing, you can actually um, provide information as to a date because the, the cipher can be of a particular uh, monarch and things like that. Um, and sometimes the make of marks are uh, within the blue and gilt, and sometimes they are on the spine here. But actually, this particular sword has no maker's mark whatsoever, and that's actually really, really common. So people familiar with later 19th century British swords would expect to find a maker mark on most swords. Um, but in reality, with Napoleonic swords, th those made for officers, frequently, very frequently, bear no maker's marks whatsoever. Whereas, um, government contracted swords for regular soldiers usually do have because they're government contracted swords. Uh, okay, so what else do we, there's one extra feature which is highly unusual to this particular 1803 and that is that it, beyond the blue and gilt, it has a family um, motif or coat of arms or something of the sort. And that is a griffin with a Latin inscription and it means something along the lines of um, God is watching you or God is watching over you or something of that sort. My Latin is, is not, it's not my specialty, but that's loosely what it means. And, and that's quite a nice unique feature and that might actually be researchable a little bit more, um, something I'll look into in, in the future. So there's the first sword studies video completed. Um, I will just give you a few more uh, measurements from the desk here. Um, just so that you can see a little bit more about this sword, just in terms of the space within the grip, from the um, guard down to the knuckle bow, there is 10 centimeters, which is four inches. Um, the guard width here is six centimeters at the widest point, and the space um, within, to, so that the, the shortest space here between the grip and the knuckle bow is five centimeters or two inches. So that just gives you a little bit more about the dimensions for the 1803 or this particular example, because remember um, it is a regulation sword, but to call it a pattern sword doesn't really do it justice because pattern suggests that they're all made from literally a pattern. And that's not the case with these 1803s is that the, the guard very much was, but the rest of the sword um, or the blades really um, wasn't, they could vary an awful lot. So I do hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, I will just give you one more measurement just to use um, the other caliper that I've got because I can because it's here and you might be wondering about the depth down here well that drops down to 2.3 and even at the the widest point here 4.3 centimeters so where I said that it's kind of 10 mil thick here that fuller drops down to 4.3 millimeters uh, in terms of depth so you can see how much that fuller takes out particularly as how wide it really is on this sword so that's the first Sword Studies video. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's all a bit of an experiment at this stage, so give me your thoughts below and um, we'll, we'll see about uh, improving them and changing them as they go. If you've got any, any ideas about things you'd like to know with them or measurements you'd like to take, uh, put it in the video or in the comment section below and I will see what I can do. Thanks for watching.